Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Gillian Forrester. She is a professor of comparative cognition in the School of Psychology at the University of Sussex. She is the director of the Comparative Cognition Group investigating the behaviors and brain organization of children, gorillas, and chimpanzees, focusing on how cognitive abilities evolve and develop over time and across species. And today we're going to focus mostly on the evolution of handedness, what it is, and how it relates to cognitive abilities. So, Dr. Forrester, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for having me. So let's start with what I just mentioned. So what is endedness? And, and I, I, I think that in this specific case, it's really important to start with the definition because uh, how the way people commonly understand endedness, it is not exactly uh, what uh, your object of study is, right? Absolutely. So, so I think the common definition of handedness for most people uh, would be with which hand do you write? Um, and this has become kind of an entrenched view, um, but it's a very simplified view of what handedness is. Nevertheless, it's, it's actually part of our identities, which is kind of interesting. But handedness has so many other characteristics that we tend not to really think about. Um, and we, uh, in the scientific community, can measure that in many different ways from which hand do you prefer to use, for example, if you're writing. So for me, that's my right hand and that's the majority of the population. But it could also be um, the accuracy or the precision of movements that I do with my two hands. And interestingly, there's far less difference between your right and left hand for doing those kinds of actions than one might think. Um, so again, there's very different types of measurements, but then there's also the consideration that handedness is not totally binary. So we think of it as being left or right. It's a categorical choice. But actually, like I said, you can measure the precision or the preference. Um, and with that, you've got a scale so you can be uh, very strongly right-handed, for example, or very weakly right-handed um, for your accuracy or your preference. And so we look at it on this continuous scale of weak to strong, or some people are equally handed for different kinds of activities, and we might say that they're ambidextrous. Right, and from an evolutionary perspective, uh, how do you understand it? I mean, how did it evolve? Of course, I imagine that only animals who have hands <laughs> would have handedness, right? Or, uh, or am I just making a silly comment here? No, I mean, but you're asking a huge question. So there's lots <laughs> to unpack there. Um, and it does go back to the way our brains are organized. And, and we know that we've got two hemispheres to the brain they look rather symmetrical, but there are minor differences in the way that they function. And one of the things that we've kind of uncovered over the last, I guess, like 30, 40 years of science um, is that the specializations of the two sides of the brain have an impact on our behaviors and they cause some biases in the way that, that we move our bodies around. Um, so, for example, um, we've got the two sides of the brain, and they actually control the, the motor behavior of the opposite sides of our bodies. So if I've got a specialization for something in one side, it's going to show up on the other side of my body. Um, and this is what we've realized about how handedness works, but there are other behavioral biases as well. And we originally thought that handedness was a human unique trait. And as you said, Ricardo, like it must be only if you have hands, but actually we think it dates much older than humans having hands. And we can find these motor biases um, going back uh, through, through other primates, through mammals, even back through um, uh, reptiles, amphibians, bird species. 
Um, and there's even some evidence that that there are these biases in invertebrates. Oh, so wait a minute. So uh, b uh, birds also have handedness. Well, they don't have handedness per se, because obviously <laughs> they don't have hands, but they might have footedness and mm. they might have eyedness. So you might have an eye preference for certain functions. Um, but definitely we see paw and foot preferences in different mammals. We see hand dominance in, in different primates, mm. um, but they are context specific. So they are tied to the specialization of the, the hemispheres. Um, and what, what, we, what we've revealed is that um, it's the left side of the brain for most vertebrates that actually control kind of motor action sequences, things that require a little bit more planning or maybe fine motor coordination. Um, they tend to be dominant within the left hemisphere and then manifest on the right side of the body. Mm -hmm. So, in your studies, you focus a lot on great apes. Uh, I mean, we are also a great ape, but you also study, for example, gorillas and chimpanzees. So, how do the, their hands work? Because I hear, for example, from anthropologists and biologists that uh, we have particularly dexterous hands, I mean, we can move our hands in more ways than other great apes can and manipulate objects with more precision and dexterity than them. Is that really correct or uh, could it be that it has something to do also with some cultural inputs or something like that? I would definitely tend to agree that we have um, more dexterity and and mm. and that that has an evolutionary story itself. So um, I'm, mm. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. but before before I do, apes will definitely beat us on having more thumbs than we have because if you think about their feet, um, you know their feet also have opposable thumbs which allow them to hold on. And, and grasp you know, diff differently from us. Um, but that said, we think that when we stood up bipedally, when hum ancient humans stood up about four million years ago, um, it changed the way our skeleton sits. Um, so not only did it kind of uh, make us better at things like running and um, <clears throat> it changed the way we birth babies because it narrowed our hips. Um, it also didn't, we didn't need our hands for climbing anymore, and we didn't need our hands for even walking because our, our, our great ape cousins, the ones that are with us on this planet currently, um, we still think of them as uh, quadrupeds, right? That when they walk, they're knuckle walking and they're using all four limbs to walk. And, and we don't need to do that anymore. And so what we think might have happened is that with this shift in our posture, our hands became freed up to use tools um, and to do different activities like gesture. Uh, and, and the more we interacted with the environment, the more we honed these skills, um, there was a, a shift in the, in the way our hands look in comparison to other great apes, particularly with um, the size of the thumbs, for example. They're, they're quite different from other apes. But what's most striking is that our grip, we are the only great ape that can do a pad to pad grip. So if you if you look at your index finger and your thumb, the flat surfaces of those can pinch together and not pinch and pinch together with quite a lot of force. Um, and that allows us to do some really fine manipulative actions that our great ape cousins can't quite do in the same way. Now, they can still do precision activity, but if you watch a gorilla or a chimpanzee or an orangutan um, take a stick maybe and, and try to solve a problem. So this is, this is a lot of the research I've been doing recently, so kind of puzzle boxes and sticks. Um, you'll find that, that their grip is with the thumb to the palm of the hand mm -hmm. um, or, or over the side, so more like a power grip which for us we'd see in young children before they develop their dexterity, but it doesn't give them the same sort of control 
um, and we see similar sorts of, of grips in, in apes. So they will, they will do these different, or even to the side. Sometimes that gives them quite a lot of precision uh, pad to the side of the hand. So, um, so the, they don't do things like these, for example? Right, we or... don't see that in other apes. Now, whether or not it's documented in, in some, you know, some keepers or wild field researchers have, have seen it, um, is possible, but it hasn't been reported in the literature to date. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are certainly differences in anatomy and functionality. Yeah, and some of that is down to the proportion of the thumb and the finger sizes. This is easy for us to do. It's not so easy for other apes to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does handedness work in those other great apes like gorillas and chimpanzees? I mean, is it the same as in humans? Do they also have, uh, or many of them also do also have uh, a dominant hand or foot? Even are they ambidextrous, or how does it work exactly? No, it's a great question. Um, and until very recently, we just assumed this was a human unique uh, attribute. And part of the reason why we had this view was because um, of researchers from, from the 1800s, uh, Paul Broca and, and Carl Wernicke, who studied language, they noticed that um, there was this really high association between the human population being right-handed and language being dominant in the left hemisphere of the brain. Mm -hmm. And they understood that behavior manifested on the opposite side of the body. And they just assumed that because there was such a high correlation because, between language function and handedness, that handedness must have been somehow a byproduct of our language capabilities. But we now know from archaeological evidence that we've been stone tool users for at least three million years. I think that it keeps going back every time we find new stuff. Um, and that you can you can survey, you can examine uh, the the flint napping um, mechanisms, mechanics of of the remains, and we can see that 3.2 million years ago humans were already right hand dominant um, and it's only maybe a hundred thousand years ago we think that language emerged so the interesting component is we've been right-handed for longer than we have language but the bit of the brain that controls language is highly overlapping with the bit of the brain that does motor action sequences like making tools so much of my research has looked at maybe tool using was a catalyst for language in the brain. Um, and, and we've been looking quite a bit at that. Um, but sorry, you're gonna have to now remind me what the beginning part of your question was, because I think I've only answered half. Uh, yeah, I was asking you if uh, other great tapes also have uh, dominant hands or yeah. feet. So, so because now we understand that actually the handedness has a really long evolutionary history, um, we started looking for it in apes. The traditional classic studies showed that apes didn't have um, hand dominance, but we weren't very fair in the way that we were assessing it. In humans, our hand dominance is assessed primarily by tool use. And with apes, we were just looking at any old behavior. We were looking at their feeding behavior, we were looking at their tool using, but Apes don't use tools as much as humans, so there was a frequency issue here. Um, and so my research, um, gosh, this goes back about 10 years ago now, I started looking at um, tool use in apes specifically. So if they were going to reach out for an object in which they needed to manipulate it, or if they were going to reach to a social partner, for example, were there going to be differences in which hand they chose? Um, and absolutely, I found that there was a right hand dominance at the group level um, for chimpanzees and gorillas. And colleagues of mine uh, have also done this kind of work, particularly Bill Hopkins is really well known for doing this work, um, have all found consistently 
that yes, our, our great ape cousins do have handedness. We don't think necessarily that they have it to the same strength that we have. Um, so they might not be as strongly handed as we are as a population. Um, and they have left-handers and they have ambidextrous individuals just like we do in their populations, but they are the minority. Um, but we could suggest that the reason that we have such a high sensitivity to our handedness is that we now live in a world where we are object users all the time and we've honed these skills and strengthened those areas of the brain um, that, that we use to, to do manipulations with objects. Mm -hmm. So now this is a question not only about the other great apes but also including humans. Uh, he is handedness innate and I know I'm aware that the term innate is very much disputed, particularly among developmental psychologists, because sometimes it means things like being a fixed behavior, being a behavior that uh, is basically uh, immune or impermeable to any kinds of social or environmental input, something like that. And many times it's not at all like that, that things work. But still, do, do we have... Uh, let's say, a uh, biological tendency for handedness and particularly for having w uh, one dominant hand or the other? Um, so to, to talk about the innateness first, I think with our understanding of the, the differences in, in brain function for the two sides of the brain, with, with the left mm -hmm. side having this dominance for motor action sequencing, and, and now understanding that this isn't just a human unique trait, but this is something that dates back many millions of years, uh, probably to where the first vertebrates at least emerged. So we're talking 500 million years ago in the Cambrian period. This suggests that there is a biological propensity for our population to be right-handed. Now that's at the population level. Mm -hmm. At the individual level, also there are so many variables that come into play, as you mentioned. So I think all of our, even if we have a predisposition for a particular behavior, there are then all of the environmental factors um, which will influence those behaviors. And what would, in the case of handedness, what would be some of those environmental factors? Um, well, we have cultural behaviors. So, for example, you know, we uh, walk on certain sides in, in different countries. We drive on certain sides of the road in other countries. We shake hands in a particular way. We, we kiss each other in, in specific ways. Um, and these things will all modify the way that we behave and, and they might sway these biases. And we can think about people who were children in the 1950s, if they expressed left-handedness, they were often um, restricted to using only their right hand for writing, uh, which will have obviously impacted um, their their hand dominance. So so I think there are there are lots of different things that can affect this, including things like neurodevelopmental disorders. Mm -hmm. um, so with with early maybe disruption or differences in the way that the brain is organized, uh, for those individuals, we might see different patterns of handedness in those populations. But we do see really, really early on, there's some lovely studies that look at thumb sucking in the womb and that there is an 80% correlation between the hand that the infant sucks their thumb with in utero and their subsequent hand dominance for writing um, by age five, I think. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned very briefly schooling there. And I, I would like to ask you specifically about that when it comes to, stud uh, to studying dominant hands in a population, I mean, particularly for the countries who have had schooling for the longest periods of time. Uh, I mean, because, I mean, even in the 90s here in Portugal, I mean, when I was in primary school back then, 
uh, it was still the case that my left-handed uh, colleagues and left-handed children were very much sort of coerced by the teachers into using their right hands to write. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, couldn't there be a little bit of a bias here, depending on the population? Because couldn't it be that uh, many people that would have been left-handed are ambidextrous or perhaps are right-handed because they were forced in a particular social environment to use their right hand just because it is the norm, for example. Yeah, but yes, absolutely. That That is very much the case. Um, but we also have other ways to look at if, if the right handedness is um, the manifestation of the left side of the brain's specialization in these fine motor action sequences, mm -hmm. We know that that fine motor action sequences also underpins other behaviors like speech for language, um, for example. Um, and we have other ways to look at the brain um, biases for, for these behaviors. So if we really wanted to dig in, we could tell uh, at the population level which side of the brain had these biases um, already uh, and then whether or not it's impacting just the language or maybe the hand as well for writing. And if you've shifted that hand for writing, um, I doubt it would still shift the, the speech uh, side. So you might be able to tell what the origin is. But again, with, with the biases of the brain, just like with our handedness, um, those biases are on a, uh, on a scale of strength, but not as strong in everybody and strong doesn't necessarily mean good. In fact, we are finding that uh, moderate uh, biases tends to be like a sweet spot uh, for, for cognition. So if you have too little, maybe it's not as good. If you have too much, maybe it's not as good, but if you're kind of in the middle, a good little balance, it seems to be what, what the kind of normal pattern is. Mm -hmm. And of course, since we're talking about handedness, people tend to focus a lot on their hands because it's the things we use to do many things and are the ones that allow us to manipulate objects and all of that kind of thing. But we also have our feet. And I mean, as a, particularly myself as a football fan, I notice that uh, it seems to be the case that people also have a dominant foot, like the right or the left foot. There are people who are much better at kicking with their left foot and the opposite as well. So uh, does endedness work the same for feet? Or not? Well, I'll first say I'm not a foot expert. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> However, the feet are dealing with much more gross motor action. So bigger right. actions like kicking a ball. Um, and w we don't require the same bit of the left hemisphere that that governs the fine motor action of our hands for that. So right. I think there's a lot more variability in footedness. Uh, so maybe in football, not only are you looking for accurate gross motor action, but you're looking for power as well. Yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily a specialization of one hemisphere. So I think you do get a lot more variability. Um, but I think, you know, if you are an individual maybe who um, had injury to your arms and you started using your feet as your fine motor articulators. So, you know, we've all seen people are able to train their feet to write, to use his hands to eat. And in those cases, I think absolutely you will have a foot dominance and that will follow what your hand dominance would have been. Mm -hmm. So I want to get more into the topic of cerebral lateralization, uh, but just also as a way to introduce it, I would like to ask you, so uh, is there a specific area of the brain that controls our hands and that is responsible for which of our hands is the dominant one? 
So the way the brain is organized, um, as I said, you know, we've got the two cerebral hemispheres coming down the sides of each one is the motor cortices. And those motor cortices are where we have the, the messages that, that move our hands. Um, but the, the two hemispheres themselves, we said, even though they can both do the same movements, uh, they'll have specializations for certain kinds of contexts. So behaviors that happen within certain contexts. And those, from what we understand, um, have been broken down into two main contexts. We've got the right hemisphere that we believe emerged as dominant for helping an individual spot danger in the environment um, and responding to that danger. So it tends to mostly bias the way we see um, and it allows us to spot novelty or threatening stimuli. So it might be faces, it might be postures that you see that look aggressive. Um, and we can test this in animals, particularly those that have side eyes. So the seminal studies were done on chicks. And chicks who are, um, who are exposed to different kinds of stimuli like threatening ones um, and also motor action uh, sequences. So uh, would you like me to tell you about the original study? Because it's quite sweet. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So um, a, a group of scientists, um, uh, including Giorgio Valatagara and uh, Leslie Rogers, originally designed these, these studies. And um, they're an excellent way to, to demonstrate the way cerebral lateralization works. Um, and I always tell this to my students because I think it's it, it, it's probably the glossy overview, but it's, it's quite sweet. So, so when chicks first hatch, um, they introduced them to different settings. So they had um, grain that they sprinkled a bunch, pebbles, and they watched the chicks try to feed on the grain. And they had to concentrate because they had to pick the grain out from the small pebbles. And they found that over testing many, many chicks, over many, many trials, the chicks had a dominant eye for choosing the, the, um, the grain out of the pebbles, and they tended to use their right eye. And then they had another condition where they would fly like a fake predator. So they had a cardboard cut out of a hawk, and the bird would fly over, and they would look over many, many chicks, over many, many test trials, did the chicks have a dominant eye, a preferred eye for looking up to the sky to look out for predators? And they found, yes, yes, they did. They preferred to look up to the sky with their left eye. Um, and then they were able to put both conditions together. So they had the grain sprinkled amongst the pebbles and the hawk flying over. And they found that these chicks were very good at being able to put one eye to the ground to look for food and one eye to the sky to look for predators. Um, and they were able to dual task. So they're able to feed themselves while protecting themselves from being eaten. Um, and, and this is where we think the two dominances for the two sides of the brain um, originated as, as a survival mechanism. So it's a parallel processing survival mechanism. You can eat and not be eaten at the same time. Um, and that's quite a powerful protector for the individual organism. And we think that that formed the basis for all kinds of other behaviors that were built on top of them, but that still use those underlying processors uh, to, to, um, to, to build those behaviors. So for example, you know, the, the being able to peck for food is a motor action sequence, and you've got to do the actions in the right order to, to get the reward. Same is true for tool using and tool making, actions in the right order to get the correct result out. Same is true with language, words in the right order to get the meaning out. So we have all of these motor action sequences that seem to have built upon the original function of the left hemisphere, which was to be able to find your food and get it in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the other side of the brain seems to have evolved dominant for looking at 
um, threat and and you know novelty in the environment to keep yourself safe. And that is the side of the brain that has become dominant for all sorts of social emotional uh, kinds of processing. So we see faces more clearly, accurately in their expressions and their identities with the left side of our vision and the right side of our brain. Um, so so this, this is, I think, fascinating and an area that I've been diving into with my research to see how much of these really evolutionarily old brain biases lay a foundation for how cognition emerged over evolutionary time and what we share with our, our um, great ape cousins, but also how does that work in babies who are just still developing these skills? Mm -hmm. So before I ask you more about cerebral lateralization, uh, one more question came to mind now. That is, I mean, it's a question slash observation. And please tell me if I'm getting here into something, if it's true or not. But it seems to me that even though we might have a dominant hand, for example, it's not that we are we are better at using it across all sorts of tasks. For example, uh, I cannot, re I'm not really good, I'm right-handed, but I'm not really good at opening bottles of water with it. I use my left hand always and opening the, um, because I drive on the right side of the road, opening the door, for example, I'm much better at using my left hand and I never use my right hand and it would feel really weird for me to use my right hand doing those sorts of little tasks. But I mean, is it the case, I mean, is what I'm saying something that happens generally to all people that are uh, it, that it's not the case that they always use their dominant hand for all sorts of tex, uh, tasks, but perhaps there are specific tasks where they're better with the opposite hand? Absolutely, yes. Um, and, and again, this goes back to our uh, rigorous sort of thinking that handedness is just about writing and, and tool using. But if you look at wider contexts, we do a whole range of behaviors with our hands that is not tool using and, you know, and not writing, for example. Um, so if, if I go back to that study where I told you that I looked at the hand dominance of apes as they reached towards an object or reached towards a social partner. So yeah. we did that study with chimpanzees, gorillas and children. Um, and actually what we found was if they were reaching towards an object, they tended to go with the right hand. There was a population bias across all the species, strongest in the humans, but it was there across all species. Um, but if they were reaching towards a social partner or themselves, they had a dominance for the left hand. Mm. And, and this was really interesting. So one of the areas where I think we forget that to even think about handedness is self-directed behaviors. These are often behaviors that we would maybe do to self-soothe. So we, you know, people play with their beards or their hair or they pick their nose or whatever it might be. And if we were to look at those behaviors, I think because it's a different context and maybe a context that's more dominated by the right hemisphere, we might see that, that we've got this left side bias there or more ambidexterity because maybe it doesn't require the, the fine motor action or the the manipulative skills of of objects. Uh, so yes, I absolutely I think there are behaviors, um, and you won't be able now to to pick your nose or play with your beard without thinking about what hand you're using. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, for some weird reason, I was already aware of these kinds of things for myself. I, I mean, perhaps I'm a bit weird, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, but is cerebral lateralization uh, connected to specific cognitive functions? Well, what I believe, and from the research I've done, I believe that cerebral lateralization emerged as this early parallel processor a survival kit for the organism. So the allowing you to eat and not be eaten. And then the way that we understand evolution works with our brains and our function is that we don't create new bits of brain, but we can extend upon what's already there. Mm 
So our brains are a really messy mechanism and it's never gonna be like a, a neat new module that gets slotted in when we have a new behavior. It's what we call um, exaptation. So we are building upon old mechanisms and the new behaviors might look really different from anything else that we've seen before, but they may still be powered by an old generator. So the example that I like to use is, is tool use and language. On the face of it, these two things, these behaviors look really, really different. Um, and we know ancient humans and all species of apes use tools and language looks like a brand new behavior that's a really sophisticated cognitive skill. But actually the bit of the brain that, that does speech is, is highly overlapping with the bit of the brain that does object manipulation to get to a goal state, not just a repetitive thing like pushing a button, but to solve a problem to get to a goal state. And so for me, that indicates that actually the bit of the brain that does language relies on an older mechanism, so like a precursor behavior, maybe that comes from tool use, um, because tool use already has in it what I would call like a physical syntax. You've got to put the things in the right order to get the correct result out. And that's exactly what we do with language. And language doesn't care if you do it with your hands or your mouth the same bit of the brain is working. Um, so I think to understand modern cognition, we have to keep going back to look at what were the behaviors that might have supported the emergence of these new behaviors from an evolutionary perspective. And that's why looking at our, our ape cousins is so exciting for me, not only to learn about them as individual species and unique species, but to look at the things that we might have shared from a, a common ancestor in the past. So the cerebral lateralization allow for the emergence of higher cognitive functions? And if so, how? <laughs> Big question. <Yeah. laughs> I'm sure I can answer that. Um, I think it lays the groundwork. So it provides a platform for higher cognitive function. If we think about the right hemisphere as being dominant for allowing us fight or flight capabilities, um, early on in, in vertebrate evolution. And now we have these abilities to recognize individual people, their faces, their emotions, their intentions. These all had to build on something. And, you know, I believe they built on those original, those original capabilities of, of the right and left hemisphere biases. Um, it, it's it's going to also take a lot of pressures from the environment to, to see those things shift and change. Um, so with humans, we know that we would have had social and environmental pressures that would have helped mold those skills. Um, and in infants, we see that you have to, um, you have to be exposed to those stimuli to develop those skills still. So a baby born won't develop language without being exposed to it. A baby born now won't recognize humans' faces and emotions unless they're exposed to it. Uh, so the building blocks are all there, but we need the exposure and the pressures in the environment and, and our, our, our social behaviors, um, or the social behaviors of others to, to have those emerge. And I think that's true both through evolution and development. Mm -hmm. Is there a relationship between lateralization and cognitive ability? So, for example, yeah, I know this is a, I know this is a complicated question, but for example, is it that if people have, have a dominant hand, being it left or right, instead of being ambidextrous, is it that they tend to be uh, more intelligent score higher on IQ tests, for example? Is there any relationship like that? So the, the research is really complicated and we don't mm -hmm. have a clear answer, but, but no is, the, is what we think. Um, we, we used to think that stronger dominance would equate to better cognition. And the mm -hmm. reason why that association was there is that in other animals, 
a good division of labor between the two hemispheres did associate with better survival in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, so then the question was posed, well, we're not escaping from predators anymore in the same way that we used to be. Um, our behaviors are more about these higher cognitive skills. So does, does it matter anymore about our laterality? Um, and what we are finding is that it seems to be good to have some laterality, but you don't need too much. Um, and not having any has been associated with some neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so for example, you do see a rise in ambidexterity in populations of individuals with autism. Mm. But this is not at the individual level. So this isn't okay. for people to kind of go, oh my gosh, I'm ambidextrous, I must have an issue. And no, that's not the case at all. These are population patterns. Um, so, so that's really important to be clear about that, not to worry if you're ambidextrous, it doesn't mean that there's a problem. Um, but that, that's kind of where we're at at the minute. We, we think that uh, for some individuals, maybe early disruption to the laterality during development could have cascading effects to their cognitive development. It's one of the things that we're actually just setting out to, to study um, in, in real detail in infants from birth. So we don't have the answers yet, but we're hoping to within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to put this perhaps in terms that are probably a little bit too simplistic, but just to get the idea across, I mean, couldn't the idea behind uh, uh, here, um, the idea here be that uh, if we have certain functions that are lateralized, then we have one side of the brain in a specific area dedicated to that function, and that would free up more space in the brain, particularly in the opposite side, for it to be dedicated to cognitive ability, let's say. I mean, does this idea make any sense at all or not? Um, I think the current theory is that both sides of your brain are involved in everything that you do, but there okay. are these minor differences that cause these biases. And while we think it would be efficient, um, maybe not to have replication on both sides, um, it does seem that, that you, you are still using both sides for, mm. for all of these ac activities. Um, but the neural efficiency comes in where, where one side will have this slight bias so that the two sides of the brain aren't competing for a response, one side will win um, where, within its specialization. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I just put that idea across. I, I didn't even know if it, make, if it would make any sense or not. But I, I mean, I just thought that perhaps if, for example, when it comes to language, it's mostly on the left side of the brain, usually, usually, that it's processed. Uh, then on the other side, uh, on, in the, the, same, the same area could be put to other purposes, let's say. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and it's a good point. And for, for sure, people who have brain damage to that specific area of the left side of the brain will have language deficits, um, which they wouldn't necessarily get the same deficits on, on the right side. Um, but you still do a lot of your language processing on the right side too, but it's more about the um, affect of the language. So it's about prosody and tone and um, uh, different aspects, but we use them together to understand people's intentions. Um, yeah, we, we, don't, we, we certainly have a lot to learn still. Um, we, it's going to be an exciting kind of future of, of trying to work these things out. Yeah, no, and it's really fascinating. So uh, another question, what is the left side cradling bias? 
Oh, good question. Um, so we, we already spoke a bit about the right hemisphere of the brain being dominant for social emotional processing. Well, originally as a uh, fight or flight dominant side of the brain. In modern humans, um, we, we've used that as a platform for becoming familiar with, with faces because we need to uh, we, we use a lot of information from looking at other people's faces. We, we can understand who they are, their connection to us, um, their expression tells us about their intentions, for example. Um, and also we can see if they're happy or sad or uh, what, what emotion they're expressing. Um, and what, what we've noticed is that there is a population bias to cradle infants on the left side. So we tend to put the baby's head in our left arm, and, and um, this is across cultures. So we see this, it doesn't matter what culture you're in. And originally the theory was, well, obviously we're a right-handed population. We're gonna put the baby on the left side. So we've got the right hand free to do our tasks. Or, or to feed it. Or perhaps. to feed it. Yeah. But then it turns out that left-handed individuals also prefer to put baby's head on the left side. Hmm. And if we look at the brain organization of left-handed people, 70% yeah. of them have the same brain organization as right-handed people. So they still have the same kind of old vertebrate template with the right hemisphere being fight or flight and the left hemisphere being motor action sequencing. So then we kind of got interested in like, well, well is this an evolutionarily old thing and, and what is its purpose? Uh, so we started looking, I'm not saying me specifically, but <laughs> the scientific community started looking at uh, lots of different species to see if there was a commonality uh, in this behavior across species. And it's now been recorded in many, many different species from African flying foxes who are bats that hang upside down and cradle their babies on the left to sea mammals uh, like walruses who keep their infant to the left as well. Um, so we see this across species and, and the suggestion is that if you put a baby who is very vulnerable, obviously, um, on the left hand side, you are using the left visual field of both of your eyes, which is the direct connector to your right hemisphere, which is faster and more accurate at discriminating the well-being and the needs of that infant than the other side. So that's one aspect. But at the same time, the baby gets a benefit too. So even though the two sides of our face look rather symmetrical, everybody knows that they're not totally symmetrical. Part of the reason for that is that the right hemisphere is more powerful in creating an expression on the left side of your face than vice versa. So we tend to have a more expressive side of our face and we're offering that side of our face to the infant. And we know that human infants particularly are born very underdeveloped. Their, their visual, their motor sensory system is quite underdeveloped. So they can only see a short distance from birth. And so we're trying to maybe give a bigger signal for them to pull uh, and, and be able to respond to. So we think it's a mutually beneficial um, position to cradle. Now it's only visible within about the first three months of life. And when baby's vision improves um, or there's more mobility and they can move around and adjust their own position, you find that this tends to disappear. Well, well that, that's a perfect example of biological continuity, I guess, yeah. between species. Yes, exactly. It's, it's really exciting. Yeah. So uh, another question. Does handedness have anything to do at all with language? Well, yes, I think so. Uh, I think that, that handedness within the context of fine motor action sequencing um, laid, laid a foundation in our brain. It, 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 it is the syntax processor, for example. So when we were ancient humans and we were using and making tools, um, we had to do things in the right order to get the right result. So if you're stone napping, for example, 
you needed to know the system for doing that to get your sharp edge out or when we became more sophisticated and we started doing hafting, which is putting multiple materials together and binding them, uh, we had to know how to do that in the correct order to get the right result out. And you can think of it as like um, hammering nails into a plank of wood. There are certain steps that you need to carry out to get the right result. And if you, you know, first have to pick up the nail, place it gently over the wood, then pick up the hammer, then, and if anything goes wrong, obviously you're either going to get injured or you're not going to have the result that you intended. And it is this same bit of the brain um, that works in language. And language has these special characteristics. We have words that have meanings. But if the words are not put in the correct order and the either gestured in the correct order or spoken in the correct order, it doesn't matter if you use your hands or your mouth, sign language works in exactly the same way, then you don't get the correct meaning out. So our language has a syntax rule that is very similar to our object um, making and using rules. So the theory is that the brain was prepared for language um, by the way we solve problems with our hands. Oh, okay. So that connects back to, I think, some of the discussions I had on the show with linguists where um, many of them recently have been disputing uh, ideas like universal grammar, where we really, language really evolved as an adaptation, but they say that other uh, cognitive abilities uh, it's sort of an uh, it's it's in a way an acceptation so other cognitive abilities were put to use when developing human language i think right. so absolutely so ex yeah. ex exactly this acceptation so we've accepted upon the left hemisphere's dominance for this motor action mm -hmm. sequencing and that later foundation and when we stood up on two feet and started using our hands more then we started extending this um, in the human brains and we became more sophisticated with it and at the end modern human language doesn't look anything like tool use but actually the underlying process for those two behaviors is very similar yeah, that's really fascinating. And uh, I mean, because you also study other great apes, do you have any idea at all if that would also connect to their vocalizations in any way? I mean, of course, people, at least for now, do not claim that other animals, as far as I know, have language, but they still have uh, uh, vocalizations, correct? So they would do. it have anything to do with handedness as well or? No? Um, so it's, it's a really interesting question. And I think we need to first think about our language as a vocalization. We don't actually think that our original language was probably vocal. It was probably gestural or a combination mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of gesture and postures and vocalization. It might have been multimodal, but we don't think it was vocal on its own. So there's been, again, this uh, real kind of propensity to look at vocalizations in other primates as um, maybe a precursor to modern human language, but we haven't found any language structure in the way that we had hoped for. Um, in those primates. But what we have found is that they use gesture in a way that is much more like human language. Um, so yes, I think that there would be, um, uh, there will be some similarities. We, we need to look at it in, in a way that is um, less human centric. Um, and that's what some of my work has set out to do so recently I developed a whole set of puzzle boxes for children and apes and the puzzles are actually meant to represent the syntax structure of language and I just wanted to see whether or not could apes solve these syntax problems because they had to work out how the different mechanisms worked together 
in the puzzle. They're rule-based, and if they couldn't work them out, they would lose the nut in a trap, and they wouldn't be able to get it out. So they were either sticking their finger or a stick through these holes and trying to move a nut through a maze. Um, but the maze had all of these syntax structures that they they had to be able to, to comprehend. Um, and at the same time, we were giving the same boxes to children of language learning ages, so from age two to five, because the idea was that if we were really capturing syntax structure with these puzzles, then it should correlate and associate with the children's language learning abilities as well. So children who could only solve very simple puzzles that represented word learning for us, like single nouns, um, should be the younger ones. And children who were able to form full sentences should be able to solve the more complex boxes that, that had all the different um, combinations of nouns and actions and, and modifiers. Um, and we are still analyzing the data, but for certain, all of the apes at least some individuals in gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans can solve these mo more complex syntax problems. And it does look indeed like the children, um, their, their puzzle solving does, does associate with their language learning skills. So for, from my perspective, to learn more about handedness, language, cognition, we just need to be really, I think, clever in the way that we design our studies so we're being fair to our ape cousins um, and, and not just uh, designing studies where we think we're superior and therefore looking to, to, um, to show off our skill sets. Really what we want to do is investigate where those skill sets came from. Now this is really very interesting. So uh, it does mean then that to study the evolution of language and particularly the biological precursors of language, we can also study, we can also look at things that are not obviously are, are not apparently related to language at all, but in fact cognitively might be, like for example, motor functions in other great apes. Right. Absolutely, exactly. And this is where my research is currently uh, rooted. And I also believe that this is incredibly important in the development of human infants and something, again, that's been largely ignored um, in development of cognition. We, we tend to look at cognition as a product. We look at it as these are my social abilities, these are my language abilities and children become diagnosed with different disorders, not until you see deficits in those higher cognitive functions. But those higher cognitive functions have to manifest and build on other processes. And we think that motor processes are incredibly important and part of the cognitive development. And so we're currently looking to see, can you see how this unfolds over time in early development? And can you see early markers of risk for children who may not be developing neurotypically? And it certainly could be the case that uh, even if there's differences in degree, for example, uh, when it comes to the cognitive abilities that we have to have in place to be able to produce language, I mean, differences between us and our close uh, cousins, the other great apes, uh, in degree, but also perhaps that we've evolved over time other new cognitive abilities that they do not have, there's still uh, some continuity. And we yeah. have to understand that continuity if we really want to have a complete picture of where language came from and how we are able to produce it. Right. Absolutely, absolutely agree. And, you know, apes have developed a communication system that works very well in their ecological niche. And we've developed one that works in our ecological niche. And it doesn't mean that one is more evolved than the other. They, they function for their purposes. Right. So uh, I have one last question. And this, one's, uh, this one comes from a patron. Uh, Robert Grasses, and I, I really wanted to ask you this because I think it's an an amazing question. And since you do work 
with chimpanzees and gorillas, particularly this is very interesting to ask you. So, uh, and he says, I would be curious about whether there are any significant differences in brain development of chimpanzees raised in captivity versus those who grow up in their natural environment. And I mean, I think this is really an amazing question. So what would be your answer to it? Yeah, I've thought a lot about this question, actually, before. Um, and this is something I, I talk about as ability and capability. So just like humans, Great apes will express behaviors in the environment that are needed in that environment. Uh, but if you shift the environment or you shift the pressures, they may be able to elicit new behaviors. So, for example, um, if you raise a, a child um, in isolation of language, a human mm -hmm. child, they won't develop language. But that doesn't mean they're not capable and the brain's not capable of developing language. As soon as you put those pressures, those social pressures in place, you trigger those skills and, and they're able to do it. The same is true of apes. You'll have apes born in captivity who will have, um, say, access to more objects, maybe, and they'll have different social pressures. And so they'll exhibit a repertoire of behaviors that fit that environment. Now, if you put them in the wild, um, they will express the behaviors that, that are required for the pressures of that environment. But humans and apes are incredibly flexible, and that is one of the things that is so special about great apes. We have that flexibility, and we can shift and change those behaviors um, based on, on these different kinds of pressures. Do I think that there's an actual structural brain difference between those born in the wild and in captivity? No, not at all. But you can strengthen um, and weaken different aspects of function based on the environmental pressures that, that you are in. Um, so we've got apes who've grown up in captivity um, and then are released into the wild and we're hoping that by putting them in a wild environment, we can put the pressures on them to elicit wild ape behaviors so that we can prepare them for a life in the wild. Um, and, and, you know, these things should be possible in, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, just to add to Robert's question, which was a great one, uh, then this certainly tells us a lot of different things about how we should think about, for example, uh, an adaptationist approach to behavior or, or the term innate, as we discussed earlier. Because, I mean, if uh, the same animal or animals from different individuals from the same species are able to exhibit different behaviors or more behaviors in across different environments then that certainly tells us that it's not just about what they are biologically prepared to do but also that their environment their ecological and probably social environment plays a big role in how they develop and the kinds of abilities they express absolutely Absolutely. I mean, you, you can just look at the way um, the differences in the way people um, grow up and the different kinds of environments they grow up in all over the world, yet we wouldn't see a difference in, in the brain structure and brain mechanisms of those individuals. Right. So, uh, Dr. Forrester, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the Internet? Oh, it's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a website called mehuman.io, which would be my public engagement. I, I do love to share science and um, I'm always involved in public talks and festivals and so forth. So you can go to mehuman.io if you want to look 
for information on that. Otherwise, um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Forrester Jilly or on Instagram. I'm at Jilly Forrester. <laughs> Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of this interview. Uh, and look, I really, really love this conversation and uh, I would really love to have you on the show again somewhere in the future. Thank you so much for your time and for coming on the show. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzka and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, George Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Nyar, Stanton, T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Daner Zmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Georgios Steofanis, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Venegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Belnick Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Alni Cortiz, and to my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all. <laughs>